thank you guys for having me here. And um, my, my talk is probably gonna be similar in concept to the two prior ones, but I'm a vascular neurosurgeon, uh, not a tumor neurosurgeon, but also spend a um, significant, of my, significant amount of my time doing research and in the laboratory. I'm a professor of neurosurgery at USC, and, um, and I wanna share some of the stuff we do with you. I, I'd start out by saying, um, you know, I remember when I was a med student and it seemed pretty daunting to, um, to try and do research and have a practice and get involved in organized neurosurgery. And the best advice I could give to the med students applying and coming into neurosurgery now is, as been said in the prior talks, it's really important to have your, um, your practice and your laboratory or research interests um, be in the same sphere as one another. Um, I do cerebrovascular research. I have a cerebrovascular endovascular practice. I participate in those societal uh, endeavors as opposed to trying to have a cerebrovascular practice and do brain tumor research. It just, it doesn't make sense. You wanna increase the efficiency as much as possible um, that you can, the synergies between your, your lab and your, uh, your research efforts and your clinical focus. And to that end, I think, I think Mike just highlighted on this very nicely. Everything that I do in practice generates the questions for my laboratory and vice versa. So it's a, it's a back and forth. And um, my laboratory is directly across the street from the hospital. So I'm able to do clinical and, and bench research and then run to the hospital and see patients or, or do my operative procedures. And then, you know, as you see here, a picture of a carotid endarterectomy. You say, okay, what can we do to improve this procedure? Or what can we learn from this procedure that, that isn't quite, you know, right from a, from a pathophysiologic standpoint or from an, a subject interest standpoint? And then you go back to the lab. And what I do is design or, or refine translational models of cerebral ischemia to look at mainly inflammation. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the things we do in lab at a very, very high level, a very surface level. So one of the models that I use in the laboratory is, is a stroke model, um, much like the patients that I see in practice. And what we do with this model is we put a suture, a heat blunted suture up into the middle cerebral artery of mice and we're able to cause strokes like you see in the red pictures on the right and get a very reproducible stroke. So this allows us, you know, as Mike mentioned, to test uh, druggable targets or, or pharma pharmacological agents or to look at the underlying pathophysiology of stroke. And one of the wonderful things about being in a academic center like any of the ones you've heard about is the collaborations. Um, my most recent uh, collaboration or interest has been looking at inflammation through the, through the lens of air pollution. So what we do with our environmental engineers is they collect air pollution off of the 110 freeway through a, through a mechanism that they've set up and we distill it down to nanoparticles and re-aerosolize it and spray it into the cages of, of half of our mice. And then the other half of the mice get what we call filtered air, regular ambient air that you or I breathe that's not concentrated. And what we were looking at in this study is whether inflammation from, those, um, from that air pollution exposure, which is very pertinent to everyday life here in Los Angeles and elsewhere, does that have effect on stroke size and stroke volume of these mice? And in fact, I'll give you some of the final results, it does. Um, the, the stroke volume that is seen in the mice that are exposed to the particulate matter, which we call NPM, that's just nanoparticulate matter from the air pollution, are far greater than those of the, the strokes of the mice that are exposed to ambient or filtered air. The neurological exams correlate with this. So this is, this is really interesting. I took what I learned in residency, which was inflammation, and then found these wonderful collaborators here at USC to be able to look at a specific environmental exposure that incorporates air pollution in a model of stroke, which, uh, which has been used by other labs, but we adopted for our studies. So, so that was very interesting. And we wanted to further upon some of these studies, but we wanted to look at it in a, 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 more, a more refined or elegant model that's not a big stroke model. So, as I mentioned, I, I do a lot of work with carotid stenosis uh, and arterectomy stenting. And what I've always been interested in looking at through clinical research is, is neurocognitive change after carotid stenosis or these procedures. 
So we decided to model this in lab. And we refined a model that another group developed where we put microcoils on the carotid arteries and we narrow them to, a, to about 70 or 30% of their native diameter. And in doing so, the blood flow you could see here on the right drops off when you put the second coil on. When you put the first coil on, it drops off a little. And when you put the second coil on, it drops off a lot. However, these animals look totally normal. A stain down below just shows, it's a hypoxy probe stain that shows you global hypoxia. They have low levels, levels of global hypoxia, but look completely normal. However, um, when you stain and test them, you see that they have white matter damage in their corpus callosum. And that's, you know, vacuoles and rarefa rarefaction of the corpus callosum but it's pretty much white matter uh, specific. And when you test them neurologically, you can see that they have um, working memory deficits and novel object recognition deficits. So this would be the equivalent of somebody who couldn't balance their checkbook or carry out their activities of daily living uh, in a normal fashion, not a big insult. So we've used this model to study our air pollution exposure and to study other inflammatory mediators to see if that made the, the stenosis worse. As I mentioned, these are just the results I'd talk about. This is based on inflammation. You can see here both the microglia and astrocytes are upregulated in inflammatory matter based on this, uh, based on this stenosis. We've also collaborated with, um, with our folks in our institute who look at seven Tesla MRI in the mice, and we were able to show uh, the blood-brain barrier opening. So what happens when you put these, these uh, coils on to narrow the arteries is three days later the blood-brain barrier opens. You can see that in the middle graphs. That's followed by the white matter damage at 30 days. So the blood-brain barrier opens first and the white matter opens later. We've seen a similar phenomenon in clinical patients when we've looked at this. Um, some of this work was done by Ryan Redwanski actually who is a, who's a med student who's organizing these boot camps. But what we showed was blood-brain barrier leakage and then the, uh, the different regions of the brain and how the peak is at day three and it comes down at day 30, followed by white matter change in the brain. So I just wanted to give a quick illustration of some of the translational models that we're using. As, uh, as Mike had mentioned in the talk before, we, we do translate this to, to human studies and we've looked at some of the, the um, mechanisms that we found in both acute stroke and in carotid stenosis. I noticed, uh, uh, I'm sure there's a question and answer period, but I noticed one question come through as I was talking and it, it, it talked about figuring out, you know, how to, how to balance all of this and what enables you. And I'll, I'll put in a plug uh, right from the beginning. You can't do any of this without a supportive partners, a supportive chair and a supportive department. So I've been very fortunate to work with a, a chair, Dr. Dian Giannata, who's enabled this and protected my time and allowed me to, um, to, to use the resources and the, the time I have to, to split between both the clinic and the lab. And once you get going, you're, you're able to, as Mike said, hire more people, involve more people, spend probably a little less of the time doing the physical lab work yourself and more of the thinking. But to start it out, you need the time and the, and the support from your department. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.